a very special welcome to you if you are joining us for the first time here at Free Church. Um, we've been unpacking the teachings of Jesus. In the beginning of this year, we felt like, hey, this year we're just going to take a year to speak about Jesus. Nothing better, no one better to speak about, just unpack his teachings. And uh, he's bringing incredible heart transformation into me, uh, into many of us in this story. So we're going to carry on with that today. But I want to begin with the story of when I was growing up. This time of year in KZN is, is the time when maize gets harvested. And it was one of my favorite times of the year because uh, getting home from school, I would head up into the fields, jump on the tractors and the trailers as the harvesting was going on. And uh, it's dry and dusty, but the goal was to get as much of the maize into the trailer and back down to the sheds as possible because after that it's, it's stripped uh, just to be the kernels and then that gets ground up to become mealy meal and everyone is covered in this white mealy meal dust. And it was just a, a moment, you've been waiting for the harvest to come in and this was a moment where everything counts, everything matters and you make sure as best as you can that every single kernel is accounted for and brought into the storehouse because it sets you up for financial income for whatever's to come. Now, many, many years ago, before there were tractors and combine harvesters and all those kind of things, as God was building the people of Israel, he'd taken them out of Egypt and he was starting to shape them into his representatives on earth. He instilled in them this principle that it has to do with harvest. Now, I wanted to read it to you. It comes out of Leviticus chapter 22, uh, 23, verse 22. And God instructs his people as he's forming them and shaping them. He says, when you reap the harvest of your land, don't reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. A little bit different to harvest time today. But he says, leave some of the edges. Some translations say, don't harvest all the way to the corners of your land, but leave what's there for the poor and for the foreigner residing among you. I am the Lord your God. And some people have taken that and, and made up a clever saying, and we sow our fields in squares, but we reap in circles. And the reason being is you leave some on the edges for the poor, for those who are in need. It's this concept of, of generosity. And the mathematicians amongst us have worked out that if you put a circle inside a square, you roughly you leave about 20%. Depending on the shape of your field, I mean, maybe a little bit less if you have a rectangular field, but the idea is that there should be something left over of what you get for somebody else. That's a very, very different mindset to the way that we work and the way we live today. But this principle of generosity is something that's important to God. It's close to his heart that there's something in his people, that there's a generosity, a giving towards those in need. Um, it's not... It's not something that is absent from his mind, but front and center, right in the beginning, as he begins to establish a people, he sows into them this concept of generosity, of making sure that there's something left. You can keep 80% for yourself, but 20%, give that to somebody else. I mean, if you want to pick a, a number, right? And uh, we see this concept echoed uh, throughout the Old Testament. Uh, there's another verse which I'll read to you out of Deuteronomy. It says, there will always be poor people in the land Therefore, I command you to be open-handed towards your fellow Israelites who are poor and needy in your land. So always remember, don't glean to the edges. If you have a square field, don't harvest to the corners. Leave something that's left over uh, for others. In Proverbs chapter 14, it says, it's a sin to despise one's neighbor. And over the last couple of weeks, we've seen how that word neighbor, it doesn't mean the person that lives next to you. It doesn't mean the person that you like. It means, in fact, can include your enemy by Jesus' definition. In, in other words, if the person is living and breathing, it's a sin to despise them. But blessed is the one who is kind to the needy. And right in the beginning of this series, when we kicked it off, we unpacked this word blessed. It's the Hebrew word ashray, which really means this is what the good life looks like. If you want to know what Jesus' version of the good life is, this is it. The good life is the one who is kind to the needy. Now, when we speak about generosity like this, I'm not talking about the tithe. I'm not talking about uh, you know, taking your 10%, the first of your income, and giving that to God and honoring, honoring God. This is something which has, over time gone by, been known as kind of a strange word for us now, but almsgiving, or you could call it charity. It's a donating of your time and your possessions uh, to others who, who need it. It's not something that is unique to following Jesus. 
In fact, all of the world's major religions have this concept of generosity or of giving of oneself, your time and resources, giving it to other people in need. And usually they go alongside, or this idea of charity goes alongside two others, which are fasting and prayer. Not unique to Christianity, but in most religions, there's an idea of, of being gracious and generous towards others, uh, to fast, to deny yourself, eating for a, a time to align yourself with deeper core beliefs and, and pray. But Jesus, he adds a twist. So if you go with me to Matthew chapter six, and we're starting from verse one, I'll read you four verses. This is what Jesus has to say about the first of these three things generosity or almsgiving or charity, and uh, then we'll get into prayer and fasting over the next couple of weeks. Jesus says, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, he doesn't say, if you give. You know, one day when you think about giving and you actually, he's like, if you're gonna follow me when you give, it's assumed by Jesus that this is a practice his followers are, are gonna undertake and do. So when you give to the needy, don't announce it with trumpets. You ever heard that uh, this person is blowing their own horn or blowing their own trumpet? I, I wonder if this is where it comes from. But like, don't draw attention to yourself as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets. In other words, in places where there's a lot of people gathered together. Don't do it to be honored by others, but truly I tell you, people who do that, they will have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. And then your father who sees what is done in secret, he will reward you. One of the things we miss in our English reading of this is Jesus switches here in his teaching from a plural you to a singular you. Before this, he's kind of speaking to a group of people, a community, and here the implication is this is now directed at you personally. And he assumes that this is something that we should do. Now, this is where I wanna get to, and this is what I wanna leave you with today. It's if I can get this thing to, this idea, this concept, this thought to stick in your mind, and it's this. Pure-hearted generosity paves the way to eternal significance. Pure-hearted generosity paves the way to eternal significance. And to get there, I've got some questions for you. And I would love for you to take these questions, write down your answers, and then stand up one by one and read them out. Is that okay? <laughs> Is everyone feeling glad you're here this morning? I'm kidding, you don't have to read it out, but I would like you to wrestle with these questions and answer them. And we're gonna go through four questions to unpack some of what Jesus has shared here. And the first one is this. This is the obedience question. Am I practicing righteousness? If you're in the room and you don't follow Jesus, you are off the hook. But if you've made at some point in your life to follow after Jesus, to get saved, to make him the Lord and Savior of you, of your life, then, then these words apply to you and he's assuming that when you follow him, you're gonna do something and one of the things that you're gonna do is be generous to those in need. And Jesus' words, of, of the, it's kind of a, a strange way to say things, but are you practicing righteousness? So this is the obedience question. Are you practicing righteousness? And if this, is not, um, if this is not like Jesus being the moral police, right? And are you doing it? But the reason why I want us to grapple, want you to grapple with this question is because pure-hearted generosity paves the way to eternal significance. So this is the first step to eternal significance, actually doing something. So there's an empowering of Jesus in his teaching here to, that will lead you down a path of eternal significance. So are you practicing righteousness? So practicing righteousness, it, it, it's a practice, it's a discipline, it's something that you do, There's an, it's hearing the words of Jesus and doing them, it's doing something, it's not just hearing and knowing and be able to articulate the words of Jesus, but actually doing something with those words. And practicing righteousness, it can be uh, giving, uh, like charity, it can be prayer, it can be fasting, it can be things that shape you to align with the heart of God. Another word that we might use for this is, is spiritual disciplines or spiritual practices. There are things, habits that you undertake that shape you. You form them and then, then they form you. So are you practicing 
righteousness. Now, here's, here's some of the reasons why uh, we should do this. One, it demonstrates obedience to Jesus' teachings. And he said, when you hear my words and do them, it's like building your house upon the rock. But if you just hear them, it's like building your life upon the sand. So when the storms of life come, everything falls down. So when you take them and do them, it's, it shows obedience. Also, doing these things, it, it shapes you, it forms you into Become more like Jesus, and that's the goal, right, of being a disciple of Jesus is to become more like Jesus so that when others encounter you, they find something of Jesus in you. This is the point. So th this is some of why the, we do it, but there's another benefit of it as well is, is when you are charitable, when you are generous, it impacts other people. When you give to those in need, somebody's needs get met. So are you practicing righteousness? You say, well, yeah, I am to some extent, or maybe not, and maybe your next step today is simply to begin engaging in, in a way of practicing righteousness. And there, there was a, um, a Jewish rabbi called Maimonides, and he, was, he lived in the Middle Ages, and uh, he came up with these eight levels of charity, or these eight levels, if you will, of practicing righteousness. So I want you, as I unpack them, to see if you can find yourself in one of these eight levels. I mean, if you're not practicing righteousness at all, you're, you're not even on the chart. So it's easy for you to take a first step is just to begin. But if you are on this journey, see if you can find yourself. The first step, the first step is uh, when you give unwillingly. Anyone ever done that? You give unwillingly. Unwilling giving. This is the moment when you like, I don't know, at the traffic light or something, and you're just like, oh. or you come to church and you feel like, oh. so there's a compulsion or a manipulation or obligation upon you, and you really don't want to give, but you give because you feel like this is the right thing to do, but underneath your motives are nowhere close to your action. You just, you just give unwillingly. First level, it's charitable, but it's the first and highest level of charity. The second level, the second level is when you give um, willingly, gladly, but inadequately. In other words, you give in a way that is very comfortable for you. This is kind of like a tip. You know, and, and, and you want to be generous and you want to be kind, but it's just, let me just take a little bit off the top. I'm not going to give my full 20% of what I have or whatever it may be or leave the corners of my field, but I might leave one maize cob in the corner of the field instead of the whole corner. So I'm, give, I'm willing to give, but I'm not going to put myself out at my expense. The, the third level, the third level of generosity is um, when you give after you've been asked. So someone has come up to you and they ask you like, hey, I have, I have a need. Would you be able to help me out? And you're like, hey, yes, let me do everything I can. And I will give as much as I can to be able to help you meet your need. So you give, you give willingly and gladly, gladly after you've been asked. The next level is you give before you've been asked. So here you begin to anticipate that, whoa, someone has a need and I have some resources where I can do something about that. So I'm gonna anticipate the need before someone even asks me, I'm gonna make sure that I can help them meet their need. The next level, this is where it gets a little bit um, uh, interesting is this is when the recipient of, of the money doesn't, well, let me say it this way. This is when the, the recipient knows who the giver is, but the giver doesn't know who the recipient is. So what they used to do in times gone by is wealthy people would walk down the street with money and coins in their cloaks and they would throw it behind them over their shoulders and the poor people would run behind them and pick it up. So there was a generosity that was happening, but the, the recipients could see, whoa, this is the guy who's giving the money to me, but the guy who was giving the money had no idea who specifically the money was going to. So this is what he says is the next level uh, of generosity and then after this, this is the one, this is, and this is really cool within the church context, we often get to see this is, is where the giver knows the recipient, but the recipient doesn't know the giver. And we've seen stories like this. People like, hey, I really feel like God has put it on my heart to pay somebody's rent for them. Would you facilitate that? So we'll put the money into the church bank account, and you pay their rent, and don't tell them it was from us. Just tell them their rent is paid. And those are some of the best stories that we've seen. So this is when there's a giving that's happening, um, but there's no... 
uh, there's no interaction uh, b between the two. The, ne the next level is, um, this is when the recipient and the giver don't know each other. So it's this kind of anonymous transaction that happens. And here, I haven't got, I haven't got a note for that one, but what I do have is an inbox card. And the reason why I have an inbox card is because on the back are the bank details of Free Church, and this is where and how we operate currently. Is we have a process of financial aid and support for people, and many of you give into that, and people who need finances come to us, and they go through a process to apply for finances, and some of you give, and some of you receive, and you don't know who's doing it. And we kind of get to see some of the behind the scenes, but this is what he says is the seventh level of generosity, seventh level of charity. There's this, anon I can't even say that word, the people don't know each other. <laughs> Just like anonymous. So there's a system, and, and I'm encouraged, and I'm grateful, and I share with you, Free Church, incredible stories where we see people are generous, and other people are in need, and we are able to play in this space where we kind of match the needs to, to, the, uh, to the givers, and, and it's just amazing. Now, one of the things about this guy, Maimondes, is he's alleged to be the one who said this saying, which you would have heard before, if you teach a person to fish, they will eat for their whole lives, but if you just give them a fish, they'll only eat for a day likely to be the same guy. So the problem with all of these seven uh, levels of generosity, it's like giving a person a fish, right? But if you teach someone how to fish, which is the eighth level of generosity, well, this is partnership and this is empowerment. And, and this is where things get real. And this is what we do at Business Forum. And the CLC video that you're, is connect your kingdom purpose to, to the things that you do in your week. And this is the place where generosity actually happens. So where do you find yourself? On one of these levels. Now, second question. This is a clarifying question. And this is the one where you go... Um, I was in church a few weeks ago, and you guys spoke about being salt and light, and how Jesus says you must let your light shine, do your good work so that all men can see them, but now Jesus is saying you should give in secret. Is Jesus confused? And he said it in Matthew 5, uh, verse 16. He said, how do I, um, in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. How do we reconcile the two? So Jesus is not saying, don't give in a way that you'll never be seen. What he's saying is, don't give to be seen. Sometimes you have to be seen when you give. Let me give you an example. We once sent an anonymous check is 6060 delivery to a family in need. The family wasn't expecting it, so they sent the driver back to checkers. <laughs> and we got a message saying, your delivery has been returned to the store. We're like, oh my God. So we had to phone them and say like, hey, um, we sent you an anonymous delivery. Please will you receive it? So there are some cases where you need to give. So what Jesus is really getting to is the motive of the heart behind the question. And this leads, and here we're really getting into it, and this is the point of Jesus, is this is the internal question. What are the motives of your heart when you give? Whichever levels of these you might find yourself on, what are the motives of your heart? Scott, um, Scott B. McRae said this, and I'll read it to you. Motive is often the only difference between giving a gift and bribery. So once I was driving back to university, uh, driving through the Eastern Cape, and uh, a friendly traffic officer pulled me over for a traffic violation, which he saw. And he came up to the window, and he was beginning to write the ticket already, and then he looked over, and on my front seat, the passenger seat, there was a, a fresh a tub of chocolate crunchies that my mom had baked and sent me back to university with. Was it a, was it a gift? Was it a bribe? <laughs> Only the motives of my heart would tell. <laughs> I'll go with gift. <laughs> Imagine, if you will, if you could plot your motives and your actions on a graph. So, so I have motives, let's start on this side, on the x-axis motives, these are impure, evil, bad motives, and then on, the, on this side, you, you have your, your pure and your good motives, and everything, you know, everything is just good about this, and then on the y-axis, you have your actions, and, and down here, you have like 
actions that are evil and we'd all agree is bad, and up top you have like pure, righteous actions. So if you start on the bottom left, what you would have, this is where, where your motives are bad or evil or impure and your actions are evil and impure. You're in the, this is kind of bribery territory, right? It's, it's the wrong action, generally for the wrong reason. You pay the bribe because you want to avoid or get something. We could, most of us would agree this is, you don't really want to operate in this space. But then there's a case where, where your, um, your motives are pure, but the action is questionable. This is the example of the uh, lady who was in a prisoner of war camp in the Second World War, and she slept with a prison warden to become pregnant so that she could escape uh, the prisoner of war camp and save her life and see her family. The motive is pure, the means justifies the end, but the way that she did that, would we do that? This is like the debate of, of ethics, and there's a lot of debate that happens in this. And then uh, on the top level, here we've got, the, this, is, this is when you just, you give out of the goodness of your heart because you actually want to see someone helped. Like you show up with a meal at their house when they in need, not to be seen by others, but just because you genuinely want to help. And then we have this kind of gray area where you're, your, um, your action is good, but the motives are questionable. And this is what Jesus is targeting. This is what he's getting at. And he uses here the word hypocrite. Now, many of us would define a hypocrite as someone who says one thing and does another thing. That's not Jesus' definition of what a hypocrite is. Jesus' definition of a hypocrite is this, someone who does the right thing for the wrong reasons. And this is where Jesus gets real into the heart. He says, when you are doing the right thing, and it's charitable, and it's good, but the reasons are wrong, what's going to happen is this. You will get all the reward that you want and desire, but it's not going to be from your Father in heaven. It's going to be from those people that you are seeking the reward from. And we can give for different reasons. We can give because we're expecting to get something back, expecting gratitude. Maybe you've given to someone you expect to receive gratitude in return. Dorothy Day started the Catholic worker movement in New York City, and she lived amongst the poor, and she helped them as best as she could. But once she was heard speaking about them, and she said, the ungrateful poor, and people were like, oh, how could you say that about the people that you help? And she explained herself. She said, if you give to the poor and you expect gratitude in return, your generosity will be very, very short-lived because you're going to be sorely disappointed. So you only give when giving in itself is the reward that you're seeking. We can also give to prove ourselves. Parker J. Palmer, I'll read you a quote. He said, um, when I give something that I do not possess, and he, he's not talking about the monetary possessions of it. He's talking about a heart attitude. So when I give something that I do not possess, if I give like this, unwilling, I give a false and dangerous gift, a gift that looks like love, but in reality, it's loveless. It's a gift that is given more from my need to prove myself than a need for others to be cared for. Or we can give because we want to be praised. Right, and this is what Jesus is getting at here when he speaks about the hypocrites and those that give to receive a reward from others. I mean, have you ever been to somewhere where they have plaques on the wall of all the significant donors? There's nothing wrong with being generous and there's nothing wrong with giving a shout out to people who are generous. But if you give because you want your name on the plaque, this is what Jesus is getting at, is why do you wanna be seen? What's the motive underneath? And we can relate this to giving, we can relate it to all kinds of things, but here's what I want you to see, is Jesus is not exercising like his authority as a moral policeman to come and judge, like how is your giving going? What he's doing is saying, be careful because there's a trap here, and if you get stuck in this kind of, of giving, or if you get stuck in the place where you give to receive something, if you get stuck in the place where you do something to be seen by others, it's gonna limit you, it's gonna become a form of bondage, it's gonna become a trap, for you. So Jesus is teaching here is actually it's breaking a system, it's showing you a way out, it's an empowering to, to help you move forward and not live in this place. And that'll lead us to our next question. And this is the eternal question. Is where do you look for significance? Where do I look for significance? Because underneath it all, this is really what Jesus is getting at. It's your need and my need for significance. 
He's not really interested in how much you give and how often you give and all those kind of things. What, what he's getting at is where are you looking for significance? And this is not something that's just limited to financial giving or giving of your time or resources or anything like this, but, but this is, is really, it's related to, to a hard issue. And, and for me, like vulnerability moment, this platform can be that for me. And it's one of the reasons why in my life I've taken a decision to not be on social media. Because I know that if I get there, the words of Jesus to me is be careful, be careful of this because you, if you go too far down this road, you're gonna start looking for your praise from the comments that people give and the criticism that people give is gonna break you. So you gotta be aware of these things, pay attention to it. I don't know, I don't know what it is for you, but Jesus is saying, be careful where you look for your praise. Because if you look for your praise in people, if you live for the praise of people, you will die for the lack of it. If, you, if I live for the praise of people, if I do this for your comments afterwards, like, hey, great preach, Gareth, or, you know, that was amazing. If, if, I, if I live for that, then on the day that someone comes and doesn't say anything about the message, that'll kill me inside. And what Jesus is saying here is, hey, you, you hypocrites who do the right thing for the wrong reasons, you get your reward in full. Because you can interchange the word in this text, reward for honor. In other words, you, if you give in front of people, to be, if you do something to be seen by people, you will get your reward because the people will honor you. So you'll get what you want. But it won't be from your Father in heaven. And here's the problem with it. In a, 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 a Richard Raw puts it brilliantly. He said, Honor is excellence as recognized by society. And therefore, self-image and, and human value are forever shaky, changing, and unreliable. In other words, when you live for the praise of people, you're on shaky ground because things will change quickly. And one day you'll be popular, and the next day you'll be hated. One day you'll go to the Olympics with a dream in your heart, and the next day the whole world will be attacking you on social media. Why? Because you look for your honor in the praise of, of people. So what do you do to look for significance? And we live in a, in a world of, of impossible standards. You should look like this, and you should live there, and you should be like this, and you should do these things, you should be seen with those people, and this is what you must do. And, and deep down, here's, here's what it is, is, all of us have a fear of insignificance. And that's what drives us to find honor and praise and reward in the praise of people because we wanna feel significant. So what do you do to find significance? Maybe you hang out with people that you shouldn't hang out with or you engage in relationships that you know are not healthy, but what are you craving? What are you looking for? It's something of significance. And what Jesus is saying in, the, in this text is when you give, when you do, when you live for the honor of people, you will get that. But here's the trap. It's shaky, it's limited, it changes, it doesn't last. It's here one day, it's gone the next. And when your soul is not tied to something eternal, you feel insignificant and in a moment everything collapses. But he says, if the motives of your heart can shift away from looking for the praise in people and you recognize that you can find honor somewhere else, somewhere transcendent, somewhere eternal. It's in that moment that things begin to stabilize and you start to build your life upon a rock. And this is what he's getting at. He says, when you give, not to be seen, but when you give because you have something of the heart of God in you and a compassion, when you give from that place, here's where you, the honor will come from. The honor will come from the, the Father in heaven. He will reward you. And it's not like a monetary reward. Oh, you give a hundred bucks, you're gonna get like tenfold return. It's not that. He say, this is it. When you give in secret, so as not to be seen, the Father sees you as significant. And that should be enough. And as you lean into that, what it does, it sets you free from the people trap and living for the praise and affection of people. And in a world of eight billion people, 
I don't think that you can tell me that you haven't had a thought, do I matter? Is what I'm doing enough? And if you're really honest with yourself, what drives your behavior to find significance? Is the fear of insignificance? Is the fear of not counting? And here's the thing, is the people in your life might not see you as significant, but I know a God who sees you as significant. And with eight billion of us on the planet, every single one is significant to Him. And Jesus' teaching here is, a, is a, His heart is not to examine your life, but to empower you into freedom and say, be free of the people trap because there's a Father in heaven who loves you and sees you as significant. So stop wasting your time to put on a show for people. Stop showing up to church because you feel obligated. It's the thing to do and, you, and you're doing it because you're scared that people will see the real stuff that's going on in your life. Jesus is saying, be, be free from that because the Father in heaven, He sees you as significant. And that should be enough for you. It should be enough for me. And could you imagine what it would be like if we caught something of the heart of God in our lives of this? And, 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 and it's not something that we must up. It's something that flows into us. You know, in, in Israel, the... You, you guys would have heard of this, the Sea of Galilee, it's where Jesus did so many of his miracles and it was like the economic hub. And there was fishing and all kinds of fish in the sea, but kilometers downstream, further down the Jordan River is the Dead Sea. And at the Dead Sea, lowest place on earth, salty water, no life. And the difference between the two is that in the Sea of Galilee, there's an inflow and there's an outflow. But in the Dead Sea, there's no outflow. When the generosity of God flows into your heart, the response needs to be. Jesus expects it to be, not because he's watching your actions, but because this is the character and nature of God as he gives, he gives. He gives his son, he gives grace, he gives compassion. It flows into your heart, it brings life. Don't hold on to it, let open your hands, be open-handed, let it flow out. And what happens? Life comes. And as soon as we go, I'm not gonna do that, I'm, I'm gonna keep my hands closed, it, your life becomes dead. And the grace of God flows in, flows in, flows in. But if you wanna see the grace of God come alive in your life, here, here's, here's what you gotta do. Open your hands and give in the way that God gives. And what'll happen is life will come. So here's what we're gonna do. Today, all the coffee, all the food, everything is for free. But here's our ask, is that when you go to buy the things that you would normally buy, would you ask how much it would have cost? And let the person at the till point tell you, your food today would have been 150 Rand with all this whatever, and intentionally take that amount and give it this week. And that's an honor request. We're not gonna check up, but what we wanna do is, is spark something of the generosity of God in you. And say, hey, you've been given something today. And if you all go and get something to eat, there might not be anything left for the people in the second service, but <laughs> we'll have to come up with something else. But as you have been given, go and give. So here's the final question, is what can I do to grow in generosity? Because pure hearted generosity paves the way to eternal significance. And only God can help you with the motivations of your heart. How do you get a pure heart? Well, you catch His heart for people. And as you begin to give, what happens is the eternal significance comes into your life. It flows in and it flows out of you. So that as, as you give and you touch, life comes, life comes, life comes. And the enemy loves to keep us in this mindset. Well, you gotta build, you gotta build dams in your life instead of rivers. No, be a river. Let it flow in and let it flow out. Let it flow in and let it flow out. And if you battle with what people think of you, do this. Pick up a card at the Info Hub. Get the bank details of the church account and start putting in anonymous deposits reference like this. Almsgiving. 
Don't put your name on the reference. Don't worry about it after it's gone. And here's our commitment to, do, to you, is every amount that comes in for almsgiving, we will set it aside so the people who come in financial need will be able to have their needs met. It's a simple way, it's a practical way, but I love the teaching, the simplicity of Jesus. Is, hey, if, if you battle with the people praise thing in your life, start to give anonymously. It might be into a free church account, it might be someone else in your life, but just start to practice this. And this is what the practice does, is, is it releases some of the mindset, it changes, it, and it just empowers you to lean into the freedom that Jesus has for you.